Firstly, I'd like to um, thank Timmy Davis for this opportunity and for all the work he's putting into it to make it possible. Um, reading through the uh, Maudsley's Psychedelic Exercises um, website, there's some things very agreeable to me. A safe space for um, people to um, share their experiences that may have become overwhelming for them. And uh, uh, some nice commentary upon um, the place of psychodynamic psychiatry, which has indeed become eclipsed over recent decades by um, more biological models. It would be good if um, um, that vibrant tradition of uh, psychodynamic psychiatry could um, um, revive. Uh, I have several friends who um, our psychiatrists would be very glad if that uh, could come about. Amongst the questions that um, <clears throat> the integration group um, asked is, how can psychedelics produce psychotherapeutic outcomes? How can they be handled in the clinic? What is the role of the guide? And what is the nature of the psychedelic experience? <clears throat> well, I hope to say something about uh, all of those, really. Um, least of all about how they can be handled in the clinic, because um, I don't actually have that experience. Um, so the simplest way to answer that would be as safe a setting as possible. Context is everything for experience. I mean, no text makes sense without a context. Um, it's the context, it's the holding, it's the uh, environment um, that makes what's possible make sense. So, oh yes, and another um, uh, thing on that um, um, part of the website, uh, maybe it's time for psychoanalysis to enter back into psychiatric discourse providing tools and lexicon to begin an inquiry into the nature of psychedelic experience and ethical therapies of practice with altered states of consciousness and into the nature of mind itself. Certainly, implicitly, a number of those things will be addressed by what I'm going to try to say. What I'm going to do <coughs> is um, read some parts from this book that I um, made um, about 15 years ago now as part of an MA in performance writing at Dartington College of Arts. Um, and it's um, made of journals that an earlier version of myself, whom in the introduction I refer to as Paul, um, made while he was living in um, uh, R.D. Lang's experimental community um, Kingsley Hall in the 1960s. So it's a very 1960s project, um, these writing of journals and indeed uh, Kingsley Hall. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to try and thread a way through this. Um, it's um, somewhat exposing of an earlier version of myself. I can't be entirely comfortable with that, but um, it's how it is. That's the subject. The psychedelics and the eye. So, a little bit of theory at the beginning of a psychoanalytic nature. You could say that all pronouns are enigmatic signifiers. It's not absolutely clear to whom or to what they refer. Um, we say I, we say I of ourselves, but for some, I is a very, very defensive, uh, narrow, constrained um, structure. Um, and for others, it's a very imaginal space with um, a free roaming imagination. I would say that in the latter case, um, they have been fortunate in um, the nature of the home that they uh, were brought up in, uh, or um, they are people who have undergone a radical 
process of separation and individuation from their home and culture of origin. Um, this story that uh, I'm going to try and trace uh, is of um, a young man. He was 23 at the time. I'm referring to myself there um, in the third person. Um, um, as he uh, got to grips with um, the frailties uh, of his particular army. Um, so <clears throat> there's been increasing um, cultural doubt about the sense of a self or a center um, that guides the development of the subject. Uh, this um, follows on from um, Freud's Copernican revolution, the notion of the decentered subject that develops in the face of an enigmatic otherness. For it decentered the eye from its place of certainty, revealing it to be a defensive structure, largely unknown to itself, but not knowing that it was unknown to itself, and given as identity by family and social pressure, spoken from the unconscious, the cultural unconscious to a large degree, rather than speaking, though with the illusion of speaking, rather than of being spoken. Jean Lepon, Jean Laplanche is a psychoanalyst who's um, developed these ideas quite far. He describes the original helplessness of an infant bathed in enigmatic messages from the very beginning. This, um, in my view, sets a, a template for the process of the putative self's immersion in others' perspectives. And for this to continue way beyond infancy, such that we begin to speak in the other's language for us. Obviously, we answer to a name given us. Thus it is that there may come a need to separate from the original family and cultural matrices in order to individuate. Not everyone seems to experience that need. Maybe the enig enigmatic signifiers that they have been subject to are very congruent with the felt parameters of their emerging self. But for others, this is the story of some who, in the context of cultural deconstruction in the 1960s, had to find another way. <clears throat> so a couple of paragraphs from um, my introduction um, to Paul's journals. Uh, Paul's approach to Lang paid off. It gave him the opportunity to explore his existentially driven interest in madness, a drive he may not have been able to avoid and to engage nakedly and fully in a path of phenomenological discovery, following consciousness wherever it would be found, and like a surfer on the crest or in the roll of a wave, pressing forward into realms of experience he had not known could exist. His original texts were written in a 60s adventure involved in Lang's experimental non-psychiatric community set in the 1920s East End of London building built by, built by philanthropists to serve the local community of Bromley by both. Um, <clears throat> Lang attempted to write about Kingsley Hall himself, but the nature of the place made it rather difficult to do so. Um, in his autobiography, uh, which covers the years um, up to 1957, uh, he wrote, Kingsley Hall, a community centre in London, where several of us lived with a number of very disturbed, quote, psychotic people, who would otherwise have been in mental hospital or psychiatric units and treated accordingly. Among us, there were no staff, no patients, no locked doors, no psychiatric treatment to, to stop or change states of mind. We declared a free for all, freedom to think, see, feel in any way, whatever, freedom of biorhythm, autorhythm for all of us. 
On the other hand, transgressive conduct, for whatever reason, of whatever kind, is objectionable. On this or any other issue, we took our chances together. End of quote. But he also said, according to Bob Mullen, that writing about Kingsley Hall defeated him. I hope the following version of Paul's journals will throw light on why, namely that as for several months, he was himself so fully a participant. So write about it would have involved writing about himself. So some of what is written here is written about um, Lang and um, who gets to be called Ronnie, because that's how it was. Um, <clears throat> so I was pretty keen on getting to um, uh, meet him. He, his book, his seminal text, The Divided Self, was out and about um, and was um, having impact upon my generation. Um, there was one bit in that I uh, wanted to read, but I don't know if I can find it. Oh, yes. Uh, I did want to read the end, end of um, that quote um, from my journals. Uh, that um, to write about it would have involved writing about himself. This he did systematically only for the years 1927 to 1957. It was then, especially from 1960, that he began the most audacious part of his career, defying all expectations, <clears throat> such that in the course of it, his signature came undone, and what accrued to his name was more than he bargained for. So I was keen to meet him, and I went to um, um, <clears throat> a talk he gave on um, LSD in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, knowing that was coming up. I went and found some LSD and took it, and the first experience, um, um, <clears throat> I recorded something like this. <clears throat> LSD. I did not hate what I went through. The yoga carpet with its dirty marks became animated, each stitch an event, and the whole oscillated in a felt of effects, forming heads and gyres and patterns, and the white walls too. Smudges on the mirror caught light, each a furry pinpoint moving independently of each other. The walls of the houses opposite became animated fluid patterns. The road with its dusk blues and velvets and yellow and black surface woven weaved like the carpet. In fact, each contained the other, a tapestry of flora and fauna translated out of and, eject and ejected into patterns of spirals and gems that lay thick before my gaze. Nests of serpent forms twisted in the myriad of all the spectrum weaving, greens, dusk, maroons, blues, in a three-dimensional carpet, <clears throat> thick and undulating, of incredible texture, innumerable of the schizophrenic's frozen moments stretched from inner wall to the end of the road, each enwreathing each, each riding through each other, non-existent for long, but others or the same continually reopening from the ground. One gazed at exploding pearls. If I looked at my eyes in the mirror, exploding red corpuscles moved across my cheek and arm, redness with mauve and violent pulse patterns. There was pulse in my face, pulse in the floor and the road, the petals of vaginas ever opening and colors and winking and being closed over and reopening and pulsing, pushing with vibration. My face suspended in my hands in a cubism of mirror, stared at me, my stare was it. So unfrozen was the reflection, veins and nerve fibers running in pattern. There was no time for narcissism. I wanted to claw behind the mirror into the inside of my head and the flowers, brilliant detail in ever pulsing brilliant fields of color. Then in Piccadilly Circus, the tall wall with the news and advert lights had nothing behind it and parts of it billowed up and back 
and raised like scars, and the sky became a transfixed slate, resting at the bleak Toy Town angle over the wall. Walked home through Mayfair, through Mayfair and Knightsbridge. Well, my comments on that experience is it's a very conventional um, psychedelic experience of LSD. That's basically what happens. Um, its value does not seem to be uh, very significant in terms of uh, raising any questions or as to how meaning arises. I'm struck by the fact that I begin by saying I did not hate what I went through. Sounds like he didn't like it too much. He also refers to himself as one, one gazed at, emote, at, at exploding pearls. The other comment is that um, he was living in um, the west of London, um, beyond Hammersmith at the time, and yet he was then suddenly in Piccadilly Circus uh, and walked home. <clears throat> I don't know how he got to Piccadilly, Piccadilly Circus, but walking home, it's quite a long walk, and it occurs to me that that has something to do with the fact that um, there is something of um, an amphetamine-like experience in LSD-25, which is why it's worth not taking too often uh, close to previous experiences. <clears throat> so I'm in Kingsley Hall. And I'm trying to engage with um, whether I'm there and why I'm there. The ex-silent catatonic, if that is what it is, seems also to be emerging from a great sleep. And there are only superficial differences between us. Frankly, that's not the case. This place is disturbing certain thoughts uncertainly in me. What am I doing here? Is this area of depth really for me? How deep down is this wrestling I engage in? Have I the reserves or even the inclination for it? I've not thought things out. Emotionally, I've looked for identification. And I think I mean by that with, um, with Lang and with madness. And haven't searched independently. I suspect myself. It was schizophrenia that led me to search out Lang. For several years, it has fascinated and haunted me. The haunting is um, a, a relevant word. Um, schizophrenia was in my uh, family of origin. My father's aunt uh, was severely schizophrenic. My father's sister, I meant to say, my aunt. And um, I don't think he ever fully recovered from that which uh, suggests a kind of haunting imposed further down the line, namely where I stood. Okay, so one of the things that um, um, Ronnie Lang made available to Noel Cobb, a poet a few years older than me who arrived at about the same time as me, um, was his very extensive library that he, he, he kept um, part of in, in Kingsley Hall. Um, so we, we read very widely in um, esoteric uh, literature, both Western and Eastern, uh, and in existential psychiatry, um, and all kinds of things, actually. So Noel and I had already tried understanding the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Um, and I'd already heard um, Ronnie speak of that at the Institute of Contemporary Arts, um, comparing the phases of psychedelic um, experience with the, the states of the, the Bardo, the intermediate states between the existences is the technical meaning of um, the word bardo. 
uh, loosely described anyway. And uh, I remember that he sat there in the ICA uh, uh, speaking um, without text written down in front of him, his eyes uh, fluttering up and rolling um, up into his skull, his eyelids fluttering down, quite a lot of blinking, quite a lot of pauses. Um, it was something that um, um, a few people who were exploring psych psychedelia uh, in the 1960s had, had begun to explore. Timothy Leary was another one. Um, so <clears throat> um, I've been in Hall for a, a couple of months and um, um, Ronnie also made available to us um, pristine LSD made by Sandoz Pharmaceuticals. It came in little files and you, you, you saw through a little um, blade that came with it and you snapped off the top and each file held uh, 100 micrograms. So Noel and I have been there for about two months. Uh, we have two purposes there. One is for ourselves, and the other is to um, kind of um, be the um, stable points of reference for the wider Philadelphia Association, which was uh, Lang's charity that uh, um, uh, ultimately held the responsibility for Kingsley Hall in this present phase of um, Hall's history. Um, I'll try to record a trip with Noel in the meditation room. This was a room at the, if you came through the front door of the, uh, of Kingsley Hall, uh, there was a little chapel on the right, which was um, said to be a refuge under English law. Um, and then there's quite a large hall. And in the far left hand corner, there was um, what we called and used as the meditation room. Um, and at two diagonal corners, um, there was um, a, um, an, a wrought iron spiral staircase, which went up to um, a large games room, table tennis table and such, uh, and then through to a dining room, and then um, some residential rooms uh, and kitchen. And <clears throat> the, stair the staircase has continued up to <clears throat> an open parapet um, where there were some cell-like residential rooms. Uh, there was also a flat with about four rooms in it, and um, a few primitive bathrooms uh, here and there. In the meditation room, mostly, with candles and incense. From mild yoga, I lay on the floor and gave myself entirely over to the experience. Noel experienced illusions of terrifying heads and mandalas. I was released from my ego, fearless of death inviting infinite consequences. Before the, full con before the full impact invaded my presence, I copied from the Bardo Turol, that's the Tibetan Book of the Dead, O oh, nobly born, the time has come for thee to seek the path in reality. This is um, the, the thou and thee and all the rest of it is um, from Evans Vence's translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Thy breathing is about to cease. Thankfully, it didn't. Thy guru hath set thee face to face before the clear light, and now thou art about to experience it in its reality in the Bardo state, wherein all things are like the void and cloudless sky, and the naked, spotless intellect is like unto a transparent vacuum without circumference or center. At this moment, know thou thyself and abide in that state. I watched the writhing of the ceiling and walls, then closed my eyes. <clears throat> Noel spoke occasionally, and later 
read out loud from the Bardo Turol. I kept shushing him, except when he read from it, and sometimes I answered him. With my eyes closed, there were unleashed upon me cone shapes of blue and gold, red and green, and all clear colours against the vacuum brilliant blue. At first they were rigid, though of infinite number, but gradually they came to weave and thread through themselves. In the midst of the experience, there would explode myriads of suns, golden ones, black ones, yellow ones, blue ones, red ones, white ones. The lights were brilliant and all around the space of my mind, which was of this exploding space. My mind was of the clear light, I believe. I was seeing the clear light of reality, that is, of the infallible mind of the Dharmakaya. That's um, in Tibetan um, Buddhist terminology, um, <clears throat> the state from which um, um, the Buddha um, um, manifests and to which returns um, without um, <clears throat> accruing um, in the departure, without taking with him or her in the departure anything that uh, has accrued to him in the meantime. My own consciousness shining, void, and inseparable from the great body of radiance hath no birth nor death, and is the immutable light, Buddha Amitabha. My consciousness principle separated out. When my eyes were closed, I could not in any sense be said to have a body, except at times. When Noel read, I would stretch my limbs, and every corpuscle of my body would be visualized before me in proper order according to the stretching. The corpuscles would be tingling blues and reds, twirling in relation to each other, patterning the form of my body, moving and stretching. I was seeing my nerves and bloodstream and my flesh lit with colored radiances from within. At other times, the coils would reappear in twos, one for each parietal lobe as it seemed, whirling upon the Buddha of boundless light. They were the pattern of light a solar system might cut through space and time, the trail of solar systems, each the most fantastic organization of pivoting stars, their lights joined in the coils of coils so fast they moved. I saw in infinite number the long body of the solar system, as Rodney Collins described from Uspensky in the theory of celestial influence a book I'd never heard of, obviously, two months before. Um, well, I say obviously, I certainly hadn't, uh, but which uh, I'd been reading while in Kingsley Hall. I was in awe and danger, thrilled, poised. I came to experience the bardo of the experiencing of reality wherein sounds, lights and rays are experienced. The coils were orchestrated, great singing electronic worlds of notes. The sounds came in chords, loud with the brilliance of each coil and disappeared to be replaced by another and another. The brilliant coils whirled and jarred, twisting from the Brahmanic aperture through my face, disappearing on all sides, especially towards the solar plexus. The brilliance of the light was all around my head and lack of body and out of its totality, the suns would explode. So near, I never saw the circumference of a single one. Some were black and others gold, all exploded their radiance over me, and I was of each of them in their rapid succession. The most dangerous moments were those when the coils would descend, whirling and twisting over my face, and as it were, threatened to collide. I was in awe of the beautiful psychosis of collision. I had to balance lying there in equilibrium to maintain, that, to maintain myself at these moments. It may be that the bursting of the suns occurred each time coils collided. The whole universe was rent in white hot exploding flame. At times I was oblivious of my surroundings. In the reality of dream, amid the light and wonder, there were no horizons or boundaries of any sort catharsis and purification. Well, that's a pretty um, purple passage bit of writing. 
uh, you'll have to forgive that. Uh, but it's um, <clears throat> um, young Paul's best attempt to um, describe uh, what happened. I suppose a comment I would make upon it was that his own ego must have been made of pretty durable stuff. Um, not to freak out and for that to turn into a bad trip. Or that experience was very well held by the Tibetan Book of the Dead, by Noel reading it, by Noel's and my having read it, and by our being in a context in which we knew that Lang had studied it deeply and had provided a setting. Uh, where uh, inquiries of this, court, this sort could take place. <clears throat> there are many paths I could cut through this book um, uh, to do with the treatment of um, um, uh, people when they were freaking out uh, psychotically. Um, how we attended to them, how we were with them um, through the night and through the day. But that's not really the subject of this. Um, the, su the subject of this talk is psychedelic experience, and um, I'm staying with that. So here's one that um, um, only a couple of weeks later, I have to confess. Um, in which Francis, my girlfriend at the time, and I took a trip. We had incense, flowers, and fruits. We lived in that room, the meditation room, with blankets, naked in the changing lights. She saw me as ugly and a god, my nipples, eyes, my prick, a tongue. Kneeling beside her, stretching wide to the light, I was some huge prehistoric beast, then a snake that hissed, and sizzled behind her ears. I was a cat, a giantess, a lady, and very sexed. The room was some womb, fragrant with yellow light, but it became cold. Sitting with a blanket hooded over her head and drawn in around her shoulders, she leaned nomadic, resting in limitless sand, beautiful and composed. As it happened, Richard Alpert from America arrived that night. That's um, Timothy Leary's um, colleague and who later became Ram Dass. Um, knowing that he was upstairs, um, uh, I will say Paul, um, became involved in permutations of, it's a matter of running to the people to avoid the experience of running from the people to avoid the experience, and so on. In other words, pretty difficult to know whether to go upstairs or to stay down where we were. I don't actually remember whether we did go up, but there was a sense that the whole building was um, in one kind of um, communication with itself. Who knows? When we, that's Francis and me, looked at each other's face upside down, the eyes turned the right way up. At one time it rained jewels, and the sharp lit tinkle of each drop falling with silver, all from a sky of soft mother of pearl. I abandoned myself to the blur and confusion of my senses. There was so much to be bewildered by, even numbed by, it was impossible to keep track of events. That's a much softer um, differently attentive uh, LSD experience. We were atten attentive to each other. One of the themes that Ronnie was um, exploring at that time uh, in his uh, life was um, how we're all sort of rather hypnotized into a sense of I. Well, 
Ronnie spoke of how we are hypnotized by our parents into perceptual habits of being in the world and how many never win free of such hypnotism. He said that he sensed his hypnotized state at age seven and broke it, and that Sartre, the one time he met him, spoke specifically in answer to Ronnie of how he realized now he was hypnotized until recently by the grandfather who figures so largely in words. This touched Alfred's interest intimately. Alfred was um, a quite a well-known novelist from New York, um, subject to psychotic breakdowns. For he feels he has been often in trance, hypnotized by capital T, them, and that they, in large part, are his parents and subsequent parental figures. So just a taste of a, another sort of um, experience that um, belongs to the 1960s. Um, Noel, Helen and I went to a concert at Africa House given by the Japanese happening artist Yoko Ono. Her second piece was called Cut Piece. She sat on the floor fully clothed. The audience was invited to cut the clothes off her. She was rendered naked. All the time she sat breathing hard, her eyes unfocused on any point, staring down parallel beams, eye muscles flexed, tensely, wildly beautiful, Zen Buddhist. At the end, she held up a piece of white card on which was written, my body is the scar of my mind. Another bit on um, Ronnie's experience of um, um, feeling himself to have been hypnotized. He says that age one, he began to realize there was a game being played that he was obliged to join in. The game was to play at being differentiated person. The hypnosis and persuasion operated by those unconscious of having forgotten themselves, then at about 18 months, temporarily won. And he forgot that it was a game and lived as if the game were the reality. Having forgotten it was a game, he forgot that he had forgotten it was a game and was completely caught up in the fictitious reality. Later, it dawned on him that he had fallen for a trap and he began to free himself, to open himself to where he had really been all along. In a way, that provides a substantial context for the Kingsley Hall venture. There was one experience um, uh, with um, Ronnie of um, taking LSD in a group. He had lived in Kingsley Hall for a few months before moving out with um, Utah into a flat in Bellside Park. And on this occasion, there was a number of us, some of us from Kingsley Hall, um, one or two with um, psychotic histories, um, uh, and a couple of people who were, uh, um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I know one absolutely was, uh, a psychoanalytic patient of uh, Ronnie's, and a few others of us, and we all took LSD. Ronnie was cross-legged on his mat, <clears throat> the wicked, no, the cruel strength of harmony in spirit and purpose that brooks no denial. At times he held his arms horizontally, below and back from the line of his shoulders, like the soaring of an eagle's wings, poised to kill. Grey and hooded in eye, hooked in claw, and sailing in strength of concentration. His hair was grey, his face purified, his aspect terrible. I sat similarly and learned how one has to take one's body with one. The body has to go too. I discovered so many positions of balance, legs crossed, arms crossed, body balanced, tilted right or left, according to the curve of the shape of the spine. 
energy is concentrated in architectural, thus architectonic placings of hands and all limbs, spine, chest, and all senses. Yusuf said on the phone this morning, I looked like the Red Indian chieftain, like a Red Indian chieftain with a headdress. She floated, was her experience, on her lily in the Pacific Ocean in many places in the room. To Yusuf, Francis looked like a heavy sun resting on the earth. Noel had the equipoise of a bodhisattva. Well, <clears throat> that description of um, Ronnie is, of course, the screen does not permit. <laughs> um, you get, just have to imagine his his fingers were in a sort of well-known mood. Does that show up? I don't know. Mudra like that. Um, both arms stretched out. Of course, he was holding the whole group. And I must say, although all sorts of things happened in the course of um, those six or seven hours, crawlings around the floor, um, people yelling a bit, all sorts of things, nevertheless, he held the whole thing. And no one came to any harm. I'm cutting now to <clears throat> the end of, um, towards the end of my journals. Um, <clears throat> for reasons of time. And because I want to um, say something about the shadow side of a psychedelia. <clears throat> the context with this part was that <clears throat> the dialectic, Dialectics of Liberation Congress um, was happening. Uh, this was something organized um, by Joe Burke and um, especially and by others and all kinds of people um, from around um, Europe and the, the States and South America came and um, spoke. It was in the Roundhouse in um, Chalk, Chalk Hill, uh, Chalk, Chalk Farm, um, London. There was a hill, there may have been a farm. Um, <clears throat> anyway, there was a roundhouse. Um, a large <clears throat> domed building. And my job was to um, manage the ticket collection at the door and to organize roses for that. Um, which I um, did successfully. Um, apart from that duty, I had free ticket to, to, to roam the, <clears throat> the building um, and to experience whoever was speaking. <clears throat> Stokely Carmichael, um, the black activist, was one, and I commented that he, he, his passion and fire, eloquent, elegant, a dark flamethrower. And then I say, I shall be the same, but of the inner world. I am beyond any culture, neither white, ideological, nor cosmopolitan. I'm learning to veer through the impasses of cultural delineation. This is, seems to me in the context of that Congress is getting way over the top. That which could be held in Kingsley Hall with all its omnipotence is 
experiences being ominous and not, not Kingsley Hall as such, um, could not be so well held in the world. I've wings to test <clears throat> that few can see. I feel devolved from Carmichael's militants. Well, at this time in my life now, I don't at all, uh, um, using um, Edward Said's concept of contrapuntal time, um, Black Lives Matter, uh, the whole story of post-colonial imperial um, loss and tragedy uh, is much with us in a way that was beginning to dawn on some back then. It was, after all, the decade of uh, the civil rights protest, assassination of Martin Luther King, JFK. <clears throat> At the time, I was standing next to David Cooper, the psychiatrist from South Africa. Carmichael declaims, Chombi is a white man. Well, Chombi was one of the post-colonial African autocrats uh, who had deposited millions of uh, his um, people's money in um, Swiss bank accounts in his own hidden name. Carmichael declaims, Chombi is a white man. Quick as a flash, David murmurs, then we can be black. But if, as Bateson, that's Gregory Bateson, he was one of the speakers there. But if, as Bateson predicts, we have a 15 to 30 year biological half life, that 50 50 chance before the annihilatory runaway exponential curve of increasingly totally unbalanced ecology, which has run way out of systemic balance, leads straight to the final ecosis. Dot, 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 is how I left that. Now, I remember vividly my experience then. It, it um, disoriented me radically as to um, all else that was um, being spoken. Jules Henry's sociology, John Jurassic's um, Latin American revolutionary, um, 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 accounts. And I was thrown because <clears throat> I have an intrinsic love of nature from myself as a country boy. And I was shocked at what I heard. I was doubly shocked that no one else seemed to quite register this in the way that I seem to. But maybe they didn't see me as registering it, I don't know. But the space closed over, Mason was gone, other speakers took his place. The next day, I, I, I think it must be the next day, I made a note. My thoughtless body collapsed when I stood on its head. Julian Beck appeared yesterday afternoon, brilliant eyed, piercing gaze, vividly present. The beautiful is out of sight. <laughs> uh, Julian Beck was um, uh, founded with Judith Molina of the Living Theatre. I spent some time with them in. Um, um, the Netherlands. I continue. <clears throat> After Paul Sweezes, he's an economist, <clears throat> and John Jurassic's ways of being in the world, I was depressed and clueless. A couple of days later, I wrote, <clears throat> 
And this is the last um, LSD trip I'm going to describe. The Congress slows the growth of my vision. That may be why I grow so tired. Last night I slept for 12 hours, waking only at 1 a.m. to undress. I feel naked in relation to the gathered expertise the Congress represents. As Allen Ginsberg, he was there too, points out, most people fall into language traps. I'm led into wild and weird beauty, vision that is young, raw, and imperfect. I engage in power play with myself, wrestling, and it's all in. The other day in the roundhouse, terribly tense, the universe of others, pinpointedly claustrophobic, pinpointedly claustrophobically impinging on me, and badly constipated, I put in. Within the movements of life, I seemed stopped dead, a horror. I left the roundhouse. I went up to Primrose Hill, where, in brilliant sunshine, having finished the ice cream I bought to please myself, I began to contain myself and try to meditate. In fact, I took LSD. Sunshine broke open all around. London was silver and gold. Sunflecked patterns of leaves and the wind sparkled with busy life. Brown limbs passed around me, torsos moving and merging through the rippling of muscles. I began to breathe, had I not been? I puzzled in labyrinths of gold, black, green, and red breath exploding in shadows and echoes. In my closing and opening eyes and inner outer ears. Do I need to read all this? I think I can leave some of that. Tension began to break up. Sun and sky became black. I died in a blaze of inner black and red humming. Yoga released me so that all sounds from air and city became heard in my inmost ear, humming, spinning, weaving. Suddenly, I sat up. I came back into being by recognizing Primrose Hill as Primrose Hill. All was bathed in singing blackness. I awakened to my sharp singularity and went away to the roundhouse. I made it through the multi-variety of sunshine shops and street sites and found myself in Ronnie's seminar. In my body, I gestured in a restrained way within my exploded self. The re-entry was a shock and not ideal, but I bathed in realization of myself in a group of people bestowed in a room within the void in rapt attention and found comfort in the aura of being emulating from Ronnie's mandalic certainty. Well, uh, Ronnie was only 39 at the time, um, and fortunately for himself, to the best of my knowledge, had not taken LSD while doing that seminar. I was. Um, uh, 24 by then. Um, and what strikes me is that towards this time when I'm going to be um, re-entering the world, I'm going to be leaving Kingsley Hall and um, getting uh, an ordinary job and um, making a career that um, I'm extremely hooked on um, the, the, a wild notion of inner life. You might say um, an overexpanded ego, which is going to have to um, constrain down and constrict itself somehow in order to be viable in ordinary consensual realities. I would also say that um, um, these LSD experiences um, whilst wonderfully enlivening um, of my sense of self and um, far-reaching, 
but either because um, the dosage, typically 100 microgram, was too high, or because um, the context was not really psychoanalytic enough. Um, these experiences did not get to the underlying personal issues that Paul, at that time in his life, was, was subject to. It took a few years for him, me, um, um, to find my way into um, psychoanalysis proper um, and to get to the underlying issues, whether it would have been um, possible um, in a less wild um, ambience than Kingsley Hall, I don't know. Um, but I do still feel that um, um, there's virtue and merit <coughs> in the ordinary psychoanalytic part. Um, I suppose my, my, my closing words on <clears throat> all of that are that my very radical experience with people going through psychotic experience in Kingsley Hall and in the subsequent um, therapeutic households that I and Leon Redler mainly um, um, started, um, that these did give um, career long um fearless empathy for me when uh, working with people um who whose experience of themselves was way outside the norm um and i feel that um those early formative experiences um did help me to um, create safe spaces um for people through the years um alongside um, the, the, the differently gritty stuff of um, a psychoanalytic process. Thank you.